So we are in the final thoughts of Jesus' final speech to his disciples. And he says to them, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. And perhaps the most obvious immediate question then is what are these things? It might seem to us that uh, most naturally he must be referring to these statements he's making about the coming persecution that they will face, that um, the way in which people will kill them and consider it service to God is what he's talking about because that's immediately before this. Um, that seems unlikely given that he has from the beginning spoken of the certainty of persecution and suffering of everyone who follows him. He spoke in his very first sermon uh, that is recorded in Matthew, um, although he taught before that and performed signs and wonders uh, in and about the villages around Galilee. Uh, the first recorded sermon that we have of Jesus begins with the Beatitudes, the eightfold uh, blessing, which really speaks to the, the path to rightness with God and salvation. And the concluding Beatitudes is, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he follows up with the, an illumination of the blessing of those who are persecuted uh, by hatred, rejection, and false accusations. Uh, th this is what will happen to those who follow Christ. He, he says not long after that, as recorded also in Matthew, uh, before the death of John the Baptist had taken place, so again, very early in his ministry, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So it seems unlikely that what Jesus means here is specifically that I didn't tell you before now that you would be persecuted. <laughs> I waited until the end. Um, that isn't what he's saying, because that isn't true of what Jesus had taught it also isn't fair to consider that this might refer to his prediction of his own death, even though that is a part of what he has been saying, and uh, certainly a part of this exhortation. But he has spoken to them of the certainty of his death many times before, and uh, not only near the end of his ministry, but throughout his ministry he has referred to it with increasing clarity. It certainly isn't true that he's never called them to love before. So though he gives a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, and though he demonstrates that in the washing of feet, uh, the servant love that he's calling them to, it is, <clears throat> it is new only in the clarification of it. It's certainly not new in the sense of uh, it being unlike what came before. But there is, in fact, something in all of this, and I think he is referring to all of this. He's referring to everything that he has said, from the washing of feet and the going out of Judas until the end of this dialogue, that these things, in all of their clarity, in all of the transformational teaching I'm giving you on things about love, about my death and its purpose and its effects, uh, about the persecutions that you will face and why, all of that is certainly, I think, part of what he's referring to here. But there is one element of it which is new, that has not been spoken before, and which explains the transformation of everything else in it. That is the promise of the Holy Spirit coming and indwelling the believers. And if you search the Gospels, you will not see that there is, until this end of Christ's ministry, 
a promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or a, an explanation of the transformation of man's relationship with God that will come to pass as a result of Christ's victory over death. And we do see really only one other uh, case of that. It's also at the very end of uh, Christ's ministry because it's well he is describing the destruction of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives a few days before this. Mark 13, 9 to 11, he says, in a similar vein, be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. This emphasis on the Holy Spirit is present in this statement, but even here he doesn't say that there's going to be an indwelling. And so it does seem that right now Jesus is for the first time really explaining to his disciples that indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. And that's important because this is transformational. The the thing that he is calling them to is higher than anything that they have been called to before. To love as Christ has loved us. But it isn't new because from the beginning he has said that you're to love your enemies. He said, you know, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So this has been in his teaching from the beginning. Um, And that isn't new either. It's not new because that is also in keeping with the law. The law said to love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't make that up. It's it's part of the Old Testament law given. It's very plainly what God has taught men that they must do is to love not only their neighbors, but all men as being image bearers. It's in the creation, the fall, the death of uh, Abel by Cain's hands, and the statement that, that God makes after the floods to Noah that by him who sheds man blood, so also will his blood be shed, for man is made in the image of God. He values human life, and so he wants people to love one another. It's not new that Jesus brought this, but the standard he brought is new in one sense. That standard is, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48. It's not a new standard in the sense that it wasn't evident always that to be less than perfect means that you cannot be in the presence of God. That testimony is right there in the Garden of Eden. That if you are anything less than perfect, you cannot live in the presence of God. It will destroy you. His holiness will destroy you. It will be pain and suffering to be in his presence. Even he who was most righteous in our eyes as man, uh, who was called a friend of God, Moses, could not see God face to face and live. That is the testimony that we are given, that even he, when he asked to see God, was put in the cleft of a rock and it was covered by his hand and he was allowed to look upon the back of God as he passed by. You know, we'll get into what that means. But the testimony is that even the most righteous person cannot ever be in union with God, cannot ever possibly uh, be right before God to live in the presence of God without being destroyed because they are not perfect. And yet here Jesus is saying, but you, I am now giving the responsibility and the command to be perfect. (laughs) 
And that's, it's not that it's new, um, but the expectation of being able to do it is new. <laughs> you see, in the Old Testament law, you're going to see that uh, much of that law is is dealing with the restraining of sin, and it acknowledges the hardness of man's hearts, and so it does not demand perfection. It calls to a standard of righteousness and a Godward orientation. Certainly the moral law speaks of what perfection is and demands obedience onto it, um, but there's also in the the civil law of Israel something that allows for divorce, something that governs slavery in order to minimize the harm of it, and so on and so forth. And and so Jesus saying, but now I'm I'm telling you you must love as I love, that is that is higher than that. It's higher than the restraining of sin, but it's also impossible. Except that he has promised this new thing which he has not said from the beginning, which is that the Holy Spirit will come. It's transformational. This closing part of his final speech is full of the promise of fundamental transformation. John 16, 22 to 23, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of my Father, he will give it to you if you ask it in my name. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. There is this thing which is about to happen Jesus is telling them that is going to transform your relationship to God. But now in the present, they have sorrow and they do not understand. This is the hour in which Jesus has told them that they will be scattered and they will leave him alone and abandon him in his final moments And they are filled with sorrow. And it is not a good sorrow. Brothers, sisters, friends, this is where we live much of the time. Indeed, anyone who does not have union with God, as is being promised here, lives here all the time. In this valley, of sorrow, a valley of fear and uncertainty, a valley far from the experience of God's love and the certain hope of his help, a valley where the trials and losses that face us are so great in our eyes that we cannot even see the image of God. where he seems a barely remembered dream, if remembered at all. Such as we are, Jesus speaks and says, you have sorrow which has filled your heart Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If we would only have right hope, we would not live in that valley. We would be blessed by the presence of of that Holy Spirit who assures and keeps and builds up those who are filled with him.
It is to such as we are that Jesus spoke these words of conviction and promise. And so we must hear them as he speaks them to us directly. To us as believers or unbelievers, he speaks that we might hear. <clears throat> Foolish hope is our sorrow. Christ's love is our salvation, and the Spirit's love is our healing. Foolish hope is our sorrow, Christ's love is our salvation, the Spirit's love is our healing. So, what do I mean when I say that foolish hope is our sorrow? I don't mean to have a foolish expectation of good things. I mean to have an expectation of foolish things. To hope for things which it is foolish to hope for. To set our desires and our aspirations and our hope of redemption on things which are not promised and cannot help us. The reason that we are in sorrow is because we want less than what we should want. That might seem strange. It is. But it's true. We have sorrow that is wrong when we set our expectations too low. If we would only set our expectations on the highest possible thing, we would never be dis discouraged in it. But we don't. We expect lesser things. We hope for lesser things. We do not receive them, and when we do receive them, they disappoint us. And they do not fulfill the need that we have sought to fill with them. Jesus rebukes his disciples for not even asking him where he is going. And there is now great sorrow in their hearts. He has told them that he must go to his Father and that the Father will send the Holy Spirit to indwell them. And they do not by that or from that inquire what he will do in the place that he is going or what this coming of the Holy Spirit will do for them. They are overwhelmed that he is going away from them and they cannot see past the immediacy of their loss of Jesus Christ as their master, as their teacher, as their friend. You might think that that seems reasonable, right? You know, it seems like maybe you should be sad if the perfect man who is Jesus Christ is going to leave and go into death. And that's true. There is a righteous sadness at the loss of a friend. There is a righteous sadness at departure. There is a righteous sadness over injustice. It's not wrong to be sad. <laughs> it's not wrong to have sorrow. Jesus had sorrow. He wept over the death of Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem for their, their unwillingness to repent. He wanted to see them changed, but they would not change. It's not that there's, there's a wrongness in sorrow, but there is a sorrow that is wrong, and that is because it is over a loss of something less than what you should, should be hoping for. You see, certainly, at least in part, the apostle's sorrow is righteous in the sorrow over leaving, Christ leaving them, over Christ going to death. But he suggests to them, I think rather strongly here, that it is not all righteousness because they're not attending to what he is promising them what he is calling them to. Um, they seem to be overwhelmed by something which is called despair.
Perhaps they are certain now, having heard that they will not be able to stand with him in this final trial, that they will never satisfy his calling and that there will never again be anything like Jesus in the world. There is a common sorrow of parents that comes when their children part ways and go out into the world to make their own way. There is a sorrow over the loss of closeness, which is not a wrong sorrow or an unrighteous thing. There is sorrow when a child goes into rebellion and brings harm to themselves, and that is not a wrong sorrow. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, as we have just said. But there is also a sorrow that is born of utter and wretched selfishness. When we weep or have sorrow over the loss of the pleasure and devotion of our children to us, we are revealing to ourselves that we had a wrong hope in them, a foolish hope in them. We hoped that they would satisfy our relational needs. And when that is no longer happening because they're just distant or because they rebel or because they have fallen out of uh, good relation with us, then we're destroyed because our selfish desire is not satisfied. But you might ask, is it wrong to want to be loved and cared for by your children? No. The problem is that your hope for them was to satisfy yourself. That's wrong. That's problematic. In the extreme, your children do not exist to satisfy your pleasure, your encouragement, or perhaps even worse, your legacy. They exist for God. You have been granted the honor of being father or mother to those children so that you might raise them up for God, so that you might lead them towards God. It is not if they are in rebellion, righteous sorrow, to be concerned about how that affects your reputation. It is not righteous sorrow if your children are in rebellion to be concerned over what that says about your own faithfulness in leading them. Because these are just not righteous hopes. Your hope for your children should never have been that your righteousness was going to make them holy. That's not true. Your hope for your children should never have been that they were going to somehow make you holy by being holy themselves as though their righteousness conferred legitimacy on you. That's not true. Right? We, we hope for our children to be made in union with God's and if they aren't, we are sorrowful for them because of their loss. That is a righteous sorrow. But when we look inward and we recognize that the thing we are lamenting is our loss, then there's a problem there. There are many foolish hopes that bring us grief. Foolish hopes and idols to satisfy our needs, whether they be ourselves, our money, our success, a spouse, a family, a government. People hope in many things foolishly to provide them the need that they feel inside. And none of them will satisfy, all of them will fail, all of them will actually be harmed by our hoping in them. Uh, we will not only damage ourselves by this foolish hope, we damage that which we hope in as though it were God when we 
hope in that for our salvation. This is not exclusive to non-Christians. Believers do this too, all the time. It is very basic. It is one of the most basic sins of mankind to trust in foolish things. Surely it is not wrong to hope in Jesus, though. Well, don't be so sure, though. The disciples hoped in Jesus, but they hoped in him wrongly. See, the, it is right to hope in Jesus, but not if what you're hoping that he will do is not the right thing to hope for. So you can even, you can be one who says my hope is in God through Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit and still be foolishly hoping because what you're hoping for is not what he has promised, not what he uh, wants for you because it's not what is good for you. And that's important. I'd like to consider our brother Fred. He's gone from us and we will never again hear his delighted chuckle at the little children playing. See the grin on his face or the twinkle in his eye whenever he told a story full of the joy of life. We will not again hear his deep conviction and sincere concern as he would approach God in prayer on our behalf, bringing his cares for his family, for his loved ones, for us, his humble spirit and wonder as he addressed his Lord with such reverence, the gentleness of his encouragements when he encouraged his unerring faithful service to his family, to his neighbors, to this church. We will not again see Fred notice something in the outside of the church and just arrive, you know, whatever, at 84 and do the thing that uh, needs to be done with hammer in hand and whatever other tools are required and never speak a word of it and be embarrassed that you saw him at work if you actually catch him doing his <laughs> good works that he seeks to do everywhere, right? That's done. We'll never see that again. Hmm. Yeah, there's a godly sorrow. It's not wrong to weep over the loss of a loved one, of a friend, of a person who exemplified <laughs> Christ well to us, even if we didn't know him well. To mourn someone that we admire who will no longer be there is not wrong. Jesus wept over Lazarus' tomb as he was about to raise him from the dead. <laughs> but what is it that actually troubles us in our loss. There is sorrow at parting, but what is its source? Surely it is not sorrow for Fred's condition. <laughs> Fred is in the arms of his Lord. He is at greater peace, in greater joy, in greater confidence than he has ever been. 
Uh, we weep for our loss of him, and that's well and good, as long as it's not for the wrong thing. I don't wish to wound tender hearts. The grief over the loss of a husband, a father, a friend, even a guiding light is hardly an unrighteous thing, but, but what are you mourning the loss of? Is it the fellowship and the sweet communion that you enjoyed with a brother, which temporarily now will no longer be yours until you meet again on the other side of death? Or is it that he's not going to serve you anymore? Is it that you might now perceive that those things which he brought to the body of Christ or to his family, no one else will ever replace? Because um, you shouldn't feel that way. What you should be doing, men, is saying, there is a man whose loss will be felt, and I must rise to the example that he sets of faithful service and fulfill those things which now will be undone by his parting. Because that's really what we're called to do. We're called, instead of Instead of falling on our faces in despair at the loss of a brother, of a, an encourager, we're to, as Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of the way of their life and imitate their faith. Oh, Fred was not a leader who preached the gospel, but he was a leader of service, a deacon for many years. Not a perfect man. He had more than one flaw, as we all do. But man, he was an exemplar of service. And rather than despairing at the loss of a servant, we ought to do exactly what is said here. Look at he who leads in service. Look at the outcome of his life of faith and emulate the way that he lived. That's what we ought to do. And this is exactly the problem is, that is facing Jesus' disciples right now, is that he is saying, I am going away. You are now responsible to love the way that I have loved and to do greater works than I have done. And they say, there's no way. That can't happen. I can't do that. Like, not only am I losing the great teacher, the master, <clears throat> he's telling me I'm supposed to carry on his legacy and I can't do that. But he says, you can. <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. That's John 14, 12. Just before this, because he sends the Spirit. We can. Because he sends the Spirit, we are able, if we have our hopes set on the highest thing in Christ, we are then able indeed to love as he loved. We're able to see the need that we don't believe we can possibly ever meet in the absence of, of a great man and we will rise and meet that need if, if we trust in God for his Spirit's help in that. If we seek it. The church, surprisingly, did not end when Augustine died or when Chrysostom died. It didn't end when Spurgeon died passed away. The, the Baptist church didn't suddenly flounder, fall on its face, and cease to be a place where the gospel was preached. Like God 
is the one who works out his will and his pleasure in his people. And so it is right to mourn the loss of a loved one. It is wrong to be in despair over the loss of one who you think is necessary for you to be right before God, to flourish with the works of God, to be ministered to by the church of God. That is a wrong hope. It's a foolish hope that brings sorrow. But Christ's love is our salvation. Our second point, Christ's love is our salvation. John 16, 7, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. A friend of mine said to me the other night, um, the conversation of Christians is such as infuriates the world because of its utter irrationality. And he was saying that as, well, he was, you know, trying to uh, work out with me how to explain that the only way to have everything is to seek to have all of your fleshly deeds put to death and your fleshly desires put to death and and then you overcome but you overcome only when you don't look at your sins as being so powerful as to be greater than the willingness of God to forgive those sins and so you're willing to come to him and receive yeah, you're right. It seems crazy when we start talking to somebody who, who tries to live on worldly logic about the way that God works out his love in the life of those who come to him because it doesn't make a lot of sense to start with, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, is not a saying that makes sense to the world. But it is true. And God works these things out. Surely my statement that it is only by hoping in the highest thing possible that our hopes will ever be satisfied, and then they will surely be satisfied, is as irrational a comment as could be made to the pragmatic, secular, godless mind. In fact, this thing which Jesus is saying that he is doing, that, that he must go to the Father so that the Holy Spirit can be sent, is such a thing as books have been written about angrily defaming gods as a moral monster. Someone actually wrote a book in response to Is God a Moral Monster, also titled Is God a Moral Monster, subtitle Secrets Your Church Won't Tell You, simply to say, yes, he is. It is utterly disgusting that you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, had to die and had to go into heaven defeating death for God to love me. Yeah. Fair enough. You think perhaps that God should just accept you the way that you are, that you don't need some sacrifice of death in place of you, and that that's a really offensive thing that God would think that way. You think that it would be better if he just perhaps invited everybody into heaven just like we are so that we could um, first be in terrible torment forever because the presence of God would be overwhelmingly awful to us who are stained with sin, uh, even though he did not actively do anything to punish us for that sin, we would be in utter agony and destroyed by the unworthiness revealed in us in the light of God. 
But putting that aside, that we could then carry on in our brokenness and sin, and that basically means, you know, uh, we, what, without dying, continue to do all of the offensive, murderous, rapine, vile, offensive, betraying acts that we have done in this life and carry them on for eternity, getting ever worse and worse on a downward trajectory without end? You think that would be less immoral than God, less moral than God saying, I will buy from you your sin at the cost of my own son's death, willingly offered because he loves me, and I love this world enough that I am going to send him so that he will love you and call you brothers and he will die for you. He will let wicked men kill him and he will bear the pain and the consequence of your sin on himself so that he can give his righteousness to you. If you will just come and embrace that you need that and he will give it to you and then he will come into the presence of holiness where he will offer prayer on your behalf, interceding for you as your, your priest, as your brother, the first fruits of salvation in my presence, says the Father, so that you might receive the Holy Spirit in union with yourself as though you were as righteous as Christ, because you will be, because he has made you as righteous as he is, <laughs> so that God can dwell with you. I am going to transform everything. You realize that even in the Old Testament, the Spirit didn't dwell in men, because the effectual work had not yet in time been done to make that possible. And in death, they were not invited into the presence of God in his throne room in the same way as, as now is possible because of Christ's victory over death. So there is a transformation happening, and it must happen or else there is nothing. There is only certain expectation of destruction, despair, and judgment. So Christ had to go, but it's his work. It's not our work. We have foolish hope when we hope in things, in men, in, in legacies, when we hope even in Christ that he will do all of the earthly work for us and just do it himself. That's foolish. But if we hope in Christ that he will make us like himself, then we have a hope that he will answer. Because that is Christ's love for us, is that he will make us like himself. He will let us suffer like he suffered, so that we will be refined into the people that we ought to be, who reflect the love that he had for us. I... I cannot explain in any sort of mundane terms what it is like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like asking what it feels like to genuinely repent and be freed from the guilt of sin. <laughs> when, when you haven't experienced that, it means nothing. Nothing clear anyway. You know, conceptually... You might know what guilt is and um, not like it, but to really be free of guilt is, is probably not something that you can even really come close to understanding. But the work of the Holy Spirit changes everything. It heals everything. It only means that we're able to know freedom from guilt and shame. It only means that our past failures don't need to rule us anymore, not even the ones we've added to uh, our lives after 
we have been washed in the blood of Christ. It only means that we may surrender to love, both being loved and loving. It means everything. That is the accomplishment of the love of Christ for his Father, extended to us as brothers. And the work of the Holy Spirit as he comes at Christ's request of the Father and the Father's sending, the work of the Holy Spirit is our healing, which is our third and final point. The third, the Spirit's love is our healing. You might not see the love here. It says that when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment <coughs> because the ruler of this world is judged. We don't like to think of conviction as a thing of love, um, but that is what we're seeing right here. The love of the Spirit is his conviction of the world. Three convictions are given, and the first is conviction of sin because they do not believe in me. We think of this conviction as being condemnation, and it is. That is what it is to be convicted of sin. It is to stand condemned, certain to die. The Spirit is he who convinces a man who despises God and refuses to accept Christ that their rejection of him has condemned them to judgment. It is perhaps working on some of us right now, telling us that whatever we thought, perhaps even we who thought we were Christians, are condemned for our lack of belief. We are perhaps being convicted, even as true Christians, that we are those whose faith and hope has been in something less than the highest thing, and that we've been hoping in men or things. And that conviction, too, is the Holy Spirit's love. The good fruit of love, peace, and joy are born only from dependence upon and hope in that highest hope of being in union with our Creator in all of His goodness. Every bad fruit results from foolish hopes. To convict us of these false hopes is love. That is what the Holy Spirit's love does. It convicts us of our idols. It convicts us of the wrong bastions that we have held in our hearts against surrender to Christ the poor in spirit will receive the kingdom of heaven because they are under conviction. That is why they are poor in spirit. Because they are under conviction, they flee from their sin in mourning and ultimately they become righteousness themselves. They become those who are persecuted for righteousness. The Spirit also convicts of righteousness because Jesus went to the Father. The, righteous, the righteousness that the Spirit convicts us of is Christ's righteousness, which we do not have, but which we desperately need. These two things, the conviction of sin and our condemnation under it, the conviction of righteousness, that is, the conviction that Jesus' righteousness is truly righteousness are the things which at Pentecost the Spirit laid upon the hearts of the many when Peter spoke to them and he said, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you know, this Jesus delivered up According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, 
that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Those listening to that sermon were convicted. They were convicted that they were sinners. They were convicted that Jesus was righteous because they had seen Jesus' righteousness. They were witnesses with the preacher that this was true. And the Holy Spirit laid upon their hearts that conviction that Yes, I am a sinner, a wretched man who hated the one who was righteous. I maybe hoped wrongly in him that he would give me something less than what he offered, a, a worldly kingdom, a Messiah <coughs> who would let me continue to rule myself and be free from the oppression of Roman government. And because I wanted that instead of to, to give myself over to union with God, I... I killed him. I participated in the crowd that cried out for his crucifixion. What will I do to be saved, dear brothers? And Peter answers them, repent and be baptized, each one of you, for your sins and receive the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, even us. This promise is that the conviction of the Holy Spirit if we answer it with repentance and submission to God, immersion into him, baptism into death to yourself and life in Christ, then shall we receive that Holy Spirit to indwell us and equip us for every good work. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The meaning of this is that the power of Christ's work would become evident in the believers themselves as Satan's power over the world was constrained. Satan was chained for a thousand years. <laughs> he was restrained. The dragon was no longer bearing the seven heads and the ten horns and so on. The point is this. <laughs> the church is here 2,000 years later. Satan no longer can constrain the power of Christ in those who have received his Holy Spirit. The declarations of atheists that Christianity has had its day are evidently false. We're still here. The church is larger today than it was yesterday. It's larger today than it was in the 1970s. There are less people calling themselves Christians and yet more people in the kingdom of God than ever there were. Um, and there actually probably aren't less people calling themselves Christians, just maybe here. Uh, there's quite a lot more in Africa and China and other places where the gospel message is increasing numerically <laughs> uh, even in the, the percentage of claimants of it. But that's not even the greatest evidence of the victory over Satan. The great evidence has always been this. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the defeat of the ruler of this world. Hebrews 2 tells us, Since therefore children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, Satan, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. 
the defeat, the conviction of the Holy Spirit of judgment is judgment against Satan, and it is worked out by the way that Christians no longer are under the sting of death. I want to tell you something. If you think that it's true that Christianity is not unique in the way that its people go to death, you are utterly wrong. (laughs) Christians are the only people who at the same time love life and embrace death with peace. They're the only people who both love life and embrace death with peace. I'm well acquainted with death. I've watched men, women, children die. I've taken lives. I'm not perhaps as acquainted as medical professionals, particular, particularly if they're in palliative care or something, but I have some personal experience with what I'm saying. Um, you know that the way that they taught us to look out for suicide bombers in Afghanistan was to look for the person who was displaying all of the symptoms of visceral terror, right? You look for the person who's sweating uh, profusely, who's shaking, whose eyes are dilated, whose uh, gait is stilted, who are barely in control of the lower functions of their body as they approach you. That's probably the guy who's about to blow himself up because he isn't comfortable with the fact that he's about to die. He isn't sure. He doesn't have conviction. Conviction enough to kill himself, but certainly not any certainty or comfort in it. There are, of course, people who go to death uh, and are not afraid of it outside of Christ. Um, But those people do that because they despise life, because they don't want to live anymore, because they do not value themselves or their lives. They do not shy away from death because life is simply torment and pain. Many, many find that they are not so sure about it when they come to that place, but many are embracing made um, because Life is no longer a joy, and they would rather not be, if only it were true that they actually stopped being when they embraced that choice. You might say Buddhists also find some sort of peace with death. Well, yes, but Buddhism essentially as a doctrine teaches that life is meaningless, and the point of, of Buddhism is to basically remove yourself from living. Uh, ultimately, and to cease being reincarnated or whatever it is, well, it is reincarnation, uh, by going into some ascended place where you don't have to live anymore. It is, by definition, a religion that despises life. But Christianity is utterly different. Christianity is a faith where people love life and do not fear death and even have joy at it. I know that Fred loved being alive. I know that Fred delighted in being with his wife, his children, his grandchildren, serving his neighbor, gardening. (laughs) I know that he took great pleasure in his many fellowships around the community, uh, his friendships with family, Fred did not want to die. He didn't want it to end. He wasn't tired of living. But when it came down to it, and in the end, the the writing was on the wall that there wasn't going to be a healing from this cancer, he smiled and went to the hospice And he, while he was still awake, was just praising how great the people were and how great, you know, 
things were with his family and how great it was that, you know, he knew where he was going and there was nothing, nothing to be afraid of. And, you know, I told the family that I'm, I'm not coming out of here and just praying for them, but I know God's going to do good. And there was no fear in him at all. There wasn't even regret that I saw in his face the last time I talked to him, only encouragement for me. You know, like, what does that to a man? I saw it with Elaine, I saw it with Teresa, I saw it with my grandmother when she passed, I saw it with my grandfather when he passed. He, though his wife had been dead of Parkinson's for, I think, four or five years at that point, um, and he now was crushed with Parkinson's, he didn't despise life, he delighted in every bit of company, uh, he was an encourager till the end, and when death came, he met it with a smile on his lips, going to his Lord. And it's not just old men that this happens to. Remember my best friend in junior high school told the story of his own brother, who at 16 died of cancer, that wanted to live, and, and yet on his deathbed just had nothing but smiles and encouragement for his younger brother, that this is fine. This is God's purpose, and I'm going to be with God. Don't worry, he'll, he'll cover for you. Like, that thing is unlike anything that you can find anywhere. This is the fruit of the union with God. Because we are not those who die. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who were asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It was not my purpose to preach a funeral sermon this morning. This is simply where we were in the text. But this is God's blessing to us that we might be encouraged by the testimony of our brother and all of those other men and women who through faith have conquered death, who now though asleep are awaiting the final victory to come, and we too shall go, most likely to death, and if Christ comes first, then we will meet them in the air, and we will go never having died, though our bodies may have perished, into victory in the union that is between God and his people because of Christ's righteousness and by the convicting love of the Holy Spirit. It is our greatest hope to overcome death and not only have life, but to become life. Is that our hope, though? Or is our hope in something less? I actually laughed out loud last night when I finished the sermon because I realized that I had not talked to Olivier and Judy about the closing hymn, and I hadn't actually looked at what Olivier sent me, as he always faithfully does, as the songs, because I said, wow, would it be great to end this with Christ our hope in life and death, and then I opened up my email to say, well, what did they choose? And of course, it's Christ, our hope in life and death. So they were listening to the Holy Spirit. That is how we must pray in closing that this would be true, that this would be our hope in life and death, that we would not place our hope on lesser things to our sorrow, anything less than Christ 
and the overwhelming victory that there is in Christ over ourselves, over this world, over death itself. For that alone is the hope that must rule us as we seek to be love in this world. I'm not going to close in prayer. We're going to close in prayer as we sing this song.